Good afternoon and welcome to a special edition of Fired Up. This is a COVID-19 update on laws and self-defense issues related to the Chinese virus. My guest today is firearms specialist attorney Donald J. Green. Let's jump right into it, Don. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bob Irwin, the staff at Rigel Studios and I have put together yet another in a series of materials and a video for education purposes for the, for the viewing audience and our listeners uh, throughout the state of Nevada and the Southwest. May we have the first slide, please? And Bob, the, again, this is a self-defense update in the COVID-19 world. Can we go to the next slide? Now, we have a slide in front of us, Bob, that talks about, you know, recent developments in Nevada in particular. And uh, we have uh, almost 25,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19 or coronavirus in Nevada, about 556 deaths. Now, as to this particular subject matter in, in self-defense in the COVID-19 world, please tell the audience what you've seen as to any increase in gun sales uh, for the general public in this state. The, the gun sales have been dramatic. We are showing increases of almost double in the amount of confirmed gun sales. These are done by looking at background check data. And so they don't include private party transfers. They don't include where somebody bought uh, two or three guns on the same uh, background check, etc. So the numbers, uh, if anything, are low for what is really happening. Thousands of people are first-time gun buyers because the crime rate has gone through the roof. Yes. Now, Bob, we've had about 2.3 million background checks just this year alone, which uh, it, it, just this month alone in June, excuse me. And in speaking with a couple of uh, owners at gun stores and private federal firearms licensees, um, we've, got an un we've got an unconfirmed statistic as follows that there is a dramatic increase in the number of firearm purchases by women. Uh, observations, Bob. The, well, the, the actual observation would be that it's the population that's at risk is buying guns. The, the uh, people in poor neighborhoods are buying inexpensive guns. Women are buying guns when they, were, they didn't think of having a gun in the house uh, to begin with, but now they're seeing so many home invasions and that coupled with the poor response time of police departments, which is off the chart. I mean, the, the news is full of uh, cases where the police cannot get to the call uh, because of crowds in the way, the officers are detailed to do something else or they've called in sick because they are off because they have the virus or suspected virus. The numbers of police are down. The number of crimes to respond to is up. And that is going to cause people to be on their own when the bad guy shows up. Now, Bob, we haven't had any gun shows since the end of January, beginning of February. Now, there may be some coming up, but at gun shows, uh, tell the audience here what you would tell to these women or these first-time gun buyers when they come up to you and they ask you about training. What are you going to tell them? I'm going to tell them that training is absolutely mandatory. We always try to give them some information. We, when I had my, my retail store, we always invited them to come to a free class to get instruction, this and that and the other thing. And because the laws change, but the problem is not knowing how to work their gun or having a gun that is so complicated that you have to make sure the magazine's in, you have to make sure the safety's off, you have to make sure the flashlight you hook to it is working, et cetera, et cetera, that when the guy comes through the window or crashes through the front door at three in the morning, you cannot remember to do all that stuff and they generally point the gun and press the trigger and nothing happens because it's not chambered, the safety's on, whatever. They have to get training in order to use it. When the training, would you consider in today's world, 
Given the incidents which we'll talk about in just a few minutes on COVID-19 and scenarios which the average person may come may, may accidentally be uh, uh, be exposed to at any given moment, uh, what training do you emphasize in addition to, let's say, your traditional CCW class? What would you what would you advise this audience to do? I, I would advise them to, besides the the concealed carry class. And a lot of them will say, well, I'm not going to carry concealed, so I don't need the class. You know, I, I have to digress here. And one of the most annoying things I had as a, a CCW instructor, when someone would come back on their five-year renewal and say to me, you know, I haven't shot my gun since I took the last class five years ago. Um, ridiculous. This is a tool you're going to have to work in panic. You have to get continued training. I... There are good CCW classes. There are bad CCW classes. But with only one guy I can think of as an exception uh, that I think the class is actually a negative. But he, individuals have to take training. It, you don't get your driver's license and you're only going to drive your car in emergencies. So six years later, when your neighbor has a heart attack and you go to try and drive your car and you can't remember how to put it in gear. Um, Guns are like that. Continued practice, proficiency, breeds, self-defense, success. Proficiency, practice is the key. Very good. Now, Bob, when we were here last time on our first COVID-19 uh, up uh, presentation on self-defense issues, um, we, you were talking about some limited uh, restrictions at the CCW Bureau, Bureau here at the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. Can you update the, uh, the viewers and the listening audience as to what's going on with CCWs uh, and, and just give them some information? Yeah. Uh, now, uh, Metro has caught up with their backlog. They've got enough employees and they are open their regular hours. Um, their system is a little different. You go, have to go online and fill out a form to apply uh, for your CCW, whether it's renewal, whether it's not, whether you're a citizen, whether you're not, etc. There's some yes or no questions on there. Um, and if you're not prohibited from a CCW, um, then at the end of that scenario, it will give you a choice of appointment times. Uh, they're getting fairly quick and you will have an appointment time to come in and do your fingerprints and so forth. Uh, if you haven't got electronic prints already, uh, get your picture taken or updated if need be. But they are running just as normal right now. There is a bit of a problem with the permits occasionally taking more than the allotted 120 days. And that generally is uh, caused by the individual. Uh, it's not the system. It's they have sent out, uh, they've got a guy, uh, the typical one is a service brat. You've been, uh, your, your whole previous 30 years, you've lived in 12 countries. And they, you know, they text a, uh, the law enforcement agency in Belgium to say, you know, do you have this person on record of doing anything <laughs> Uh, untoward and the Belgians are full of terrorists right now and their police departments are going yeah right we're gonna answer that and they don't get a response so that usually is the delay they're operating actually pretty efficiently now um, and you can yell at the police department it's 120 days you have to issue my permit you know what they're a little busy right now they're doing the best they can and if it takes 125 days my view of that is, so what? You don't lose, move, you're not in New Jersey where you can't get a permit for six or seven years. Right. Um, they're doing the best they can under the circumstances. Give them a break. They are issuing permits as fast as they can. It's a good system. Sheriff Lombardo's got it working well. And it's a good system. And are you in constant contact, maybe not daily, but are you in constant contact with the sheriff and the CCW Bureau? Uh, fairly often now. Um, uh, I don't bother the sheriff a lot. We've known each other a long time. And I see him at uh, Republican things on occasion. He is a, a Republican. Um, so it, it's, 
he's a good guy and he's trying to do it right. And if you see something he's doing wrong, trust me, it's not political. Democrat or Republican, he is just trying to be a good sheriff and handle things as best he can. Now, Bob, uh, on the streamer that we have uh, for both your office and my office, uh, can, uh, can the members of your viewing audience give you a call, leave a message if they have any more specific questions as to CCW or perhaps you can put them in touch with someone? Sure. My, my office, uh, I have a recorder in there. I don't generally answer the phone because of robocalls. <laughs> I wait until I get a message and, and do call you back. Uh, it's, uh, you can reach me at 702-257-1060. Uh, I have to caution you. If you don't leave a message, I can't call you back. My phone is not set right. up to trap who called for obvious reasons, but I, I just don't want that. So if you don't leave a message, I can't call you back and I can't answer your question. If I get the same one over and over again, I will answer it generally on a fired up show. Um, right now, they're, they're pretty much the same. Uh, I want to get a gun. What should I do? And I make recommendations depending on your background and if you're going to practice with it. Uh, I tend to like uh, double action only revolvers. People are uh, afraid. Uh, I had a call from uh, somebody that I've known for years that is uh, is got a, uh, a two-year-old. And they wanted to, what, what kind of gun should I have that's safe? So I recommend a double action only revolver by a major brand. Easy to see if it's loaded. No safety to screw with. When you pick it up and point it at the guy that's in your bedroom, it goes bang. And if you don't get him with the first five shots, you're done anyway. You know? mm -hmm. So uh, you know, it's, not, it's easy to operate and you won't forget how to do it because all you got to do is point in the general direction which generally is about a foot and a half in home invasions, um, and shoot it, easy. And then you get a locking box. If you're worried about the child getting into it, you get an electronic uh, little, one of those safes you can bury in, you know, bolt down to your nightstand or under the bed or whatever, and you bolt it to the floor. You have to hit the, the four buttons in sequence, da, 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 da. Use a number that you can remember, so you can go da, 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 da. The thing pops open, you have your gun. At worst case scenario, it takes you 10, 15 seconds to get your gun out. Usually you have that amount of time when your yappy dog starts barking. I love yappy dogs because they wake up the real dangerous dog, mm -hmm. you. May we have the next slide, please? <laughs> Bob, in the past two or three weeks, Justice Thomas uh, appointed many years ago by President George, the first George Bush, uh, has been referencing the Ninth Amendment to the United States Constitution. I'm going to ask you some questions on some practical points here. And this, this Ninth Amendment is right up here, right in front, and it's one line. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Uh, this, is, this amendment is... is, is becoming of increasing importance because it's leaving the rights to the states and leaving the rights uh, uh, to, the to the people within those states. Do you see any, like we had, a, we had an attempt in the, in the 2019 legislature to, uh, for assault weapon ban, wep ban on restrictions on ammunition, weapons uh, uh, ban on the magazines. Do you see any possible changes for the 2021 legislature of these ugly points raising their heads? Absolutely. The, uh, all, you know, this used to be an issue where you had uh, some blue dog Democrats, we used to call them, that were conservative Democrats that still believed in the right to keep and bear arms and this and the other. We simply don't have that anymore. The, the Democrat Party has been hijacked by the radicals. And I, I used to on shows when we would go through uh, and pick out, you know, we've got these three people running for the same assembly seat or whatever, would pick out who they were. And generally I'd have a, a mix of Republicans or Democrats um, based on their philosophy. The, the Democrats are so hijacked by their left side, the left side is driving the Democrat 
party now. It is anything but democratic. And so the, the only ones I end up in the last couple of elections recommending are judges because theoretically they're nonpartisans, of course. Yes. Um, generally, they are either Republicans or Democrats. Um, but that shouldn't affect what they do on the bench. Unfortunately, now it does. So mm -hmm. I still go down the list of judges. But looking at the ballots now, uh, you can only vote for the Republicans if you want to keep your guns. The Democrats have been, every one of them is we got to get rid of AR-15s. We got to get rid of military type guns. We've got to get rid of, we got to get rid of, um, we got to have more background checks. We got to have longer waiting periods. We've got to have all this kind of stuff. Um, we can't have magazines that hold more than 10 because when would you possibly need a magazine that holds more than 10 shots? When there's six people breaking into your house, uh, duh. The, uh, I guess the Democrats know you're only going to have one guy break in. Right. Oh, that's, their th that's their thinking. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. uh, they can handle that because crime, of course, crime is going through the roof. Yes. And the, I could go on for an hour and a half, but I won't. Um, but we have to, you have to vote. The way we fix this is voting. The, one, not, the way we fix this is not to take your rifle and your Winnebago and drive up to Mount Charleston and shoot the wild horses and eat them for a week or two until you run out of food. And then what do you do? You die. You're going to need to survive in the city where you are, have a three or four day supply of food and water, a few guns, enough ammunition to survive one or two gunfights. If you think you're going to survive 10 gunfights, every time you need lunch, you get into a gunfight, you're not going to be alive very long. So stay armed, stay safe, harden your house, keep gasoline in your car, et cetera, et cetera. The usual things you see on the survival stuff. It's all generally good advice. May we see the next slide, please? Bob, <clears throat> the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms uh, recently uh, submitted, as is required by federal law, in notes and comments on the new federal firearms uh, transaction report, also known as the 4473. Now, this is the form which everyone in the state of Nevada, whether pub, whether private or public or private sale or one through a gun dealer, you must you must fill this out. And uh, one, we're going to go through this for just a few minutes. In the very beginning section of the new form, and your your viewers and your listeners have got to pay attention. Right up front, the well, you've got to put in the manufacturer importer of the weapon, the model, the serial number, the type, and the gauge. And it must be completed by the seller before the transferee completes section B, and that's your name. Now, in the previous version of the 4473, which became effective in 2016, it hadn't been changed in several years, but four years ago, this section on the weapon was actually on page three of the form 4473. So right now, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms is putting the type of weapon right up front. So there, someone can't say, and I've seen this, well, I really didn't know um, the serial number. Uh, I thought I was getting a 9mm, not a 45. I thought I was getting a CZ, and I ended up getting something made in Argentina. Well, this isn't the purpose of this form. The purpose of this form is to put you on notice that you are obtaining a firearm and that you're sure of what serial number and everything on this and that it's got to be prepared before you complete the, the other information on the second one. Bob, any, any observations as to whether there's, you're going to see any resistance to this new form? Well, I, I don't think you'll see resistance to it. I, they're going to use whatever form they need to use if they want to buy a gun. Um, they really don't have a choice. 
But I, I see a, a little different flaw in this. The, when transactions were not complete, we would have to uh, save those 4473s. When we start down the thing and the guy at the, at the, we get through the first page and go, well, yeah, I had a misdemeanor domestic battery in 1937. And well, now you're a prohibited person uh, because you have a domestic battery and that gives you automatically uh, a lot of paperwork and a lawyer. You may still get the gun, but Right now, we can't make the sale. We're required, dealers are required to keep the forms of anybody who is not, com who does not complete the sale. That is so ATF can go through when they do their audits and they get copies or pick up, and we keep a copy, of the forms that were partially filled out, but the guy didn't complete the sale. That normally was to track somebody if they, they answered a question wrong where we couldn't uh, advise them to change it uh, or go to another dealer, certainly, because then we're conspiring to uh, enter the, you know, to get the guy a gun when he's, not a when he's a prohibited person. But we keep the forms. Well, now with this new form, when we keep it, it's going to show that you have to have uh, all these guns that you own on the form. So they will develop the wrong way around and backwards. They will develop a list of gun owners that have guns legally. If you fill in that you own this and this and this gun, uh, that will become part of the record that ATF has and they end up backhandedly with a list of guns that everybody owns. I, I, that may not be the intent, but that is going to be the result. ATF does a fine job of tracking uh, illegal gun buyers, yes. busting gun rings that are selling interstate and so forth and so on. Um, they do a tremendous job of that. They're their criminal investigation teams are really good. They are tracking guns in some of these major cities and shutting down a lot of uh, gigantic gun stuff that is going on around the country. But they're creating a database here that I'm not sure uh, the public wants to be in. We'll have to see how it's handled. Anyway, this is a proposed form. Yes. Uh, um, it's still got public comment on it, but you know what? They're going to use it. Yes. It's the public comment by the pro-gun people. It's none of your business what kind of guns I own if I'm not committing a crime. They go, oh, okay, that's fine. And they yes. do it anyway. Yes, and the gun dealers uh, can pre-order 50 packs. This is a commercial for ATF. You can order 50 packs of these starting at the end of July. And according to the regulation as proposed, this form will become mandatory on November 1st, uh, 2020. That's, so That's after the public comment. It after the public comment. Under. There's no question this is going to go through. Uh, yeah. They always look. I, I've looked at these public comments. Uh, the last one that we had was about, oh, I'd say four or 500 pages of comments from everyone. From the a average Joe, uh, you're, you know, what are the Democrats now calling us? The, the Walmart group? to uh, very sophisticated, uh, uh, to lawyers for, for uh, manufacturers of firearms and, and, sell, and, and gun dealers. Uh, the, the guy from uh, Bob's Gun Shop several years ago, the lawyer from him put this like 30 pages of comment towards it. It didn't do any good because the form changed in 2016. And, um, but we're, we're giving it to you first. I do not know other than a couple of things on YouTube. I don't know of anything local which is providing this. So this is breaking news uh, uh, through Rigel Studios for Bob uh, Irwin and I on this new 4473. Uh, may we have the next slide, please? Uh, Bob, the, the reason I pointed this out here, and this is only about 10 days ago that uh, Justice Thomas made some very astute observations uh, in a uh, dissent, and this was the much-awaited Second Amendment uh, case um, 
uh, which was not decided, but certiorari was denied in Rogers versus Attorney General of New Jersey. Uh, and we won't get into the facts of the case, but I'd like to quote something for your viewers and listening audience. And I quote, as this court explained in Heller, at the time of the founding as now, to bear meant to carry. When used with arms, the term has a meaning that refers to carrying for a particular purpose, confrontation. Thus, the right to bear arms refers to the right to wear, bear, and carry upon the person in the clothing or in a pocket for the purpose of being armed and ready for offensive or defensive action in a case of conflict with another person. And Justice Thomas was quoting the exact words of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg from 22 years ago. She made those remarks. And she can't change her mind now or say that she didn't, uh, that she didn't say that because it was pretty clear as to what she was talking about. May we have the next slide? Okay. Um, in this slide, uh, we want to have kind of like a public service announcement, Bob. And this is a, uh, a situation where a, uh, a uh, African-American female at a local uh, establishment got a pot of hot coffee and threw it at the employee who was burned. Now, we're not here to be police, but we're here to use the following example. Bob, is a pot of hot coffee a dangerous weapon? Certainly. Um, Don, I want to go back one second to what your last uh, comment on uh, Bader Ginsburg and, and this, uh, yes, sir. this thing. The, when I was in the police academy and when I taught police academies, we would tell the students, the, the would-be officers, this is what the Supreme Court decision said, and it stops right there. If a minority of the judges said something else, it didn't matter. The decision was what the majority said. And I, I recognize what he's saying is, is absolutely gospel, but it doesn't become the law. That's true. The law is what the majority of the justices said, and it ends right there. Now, going back to... <laughs> Yes. Our, our Crime Stoppers Public Service uh, uh, section. Tell yeah. me, again, is a pot of hot coffee fresh off the stove in an establishment when thrown at the employee, is that a dangerous weapon? It is in theory and in reality in this case, the person suffered second and third degree burns, which is certainly great bodily harm. Um, could have been a whole lot worse, but obviously, you know, the, the story came out that this person threw hot coffee at a person, and then later on in the story it says, well, uh, did I mention that the uh, coffee was still in the pot when thrown, and we're basically throwing a bowling ball uh, in size of weight and size at somebody's face that is full of boiling liquid. Uh, obviously, that is a threat of, of serious bodily injury and, in fact, was serious bodily injury. The question being, when the person responds by, I presume, pointing a firearm? Is that what the case Could was? be. No, it hasn't been yet, but that could be part of an example. Yes. The, um, is that reasonable to prevent further damage? We are into the, I, the guy threw a knife at me and I fired my gun at him while the knife was in the air coming toward me. Or I heard kalunk as the knife hit the car behind me, then I fired my gun. And you shot now at a guy who was unarmed. Uh, it's all in the timing. But so, in, in this instant case, there is no timing. They were actually injured. So we don't need to get into the woods 
And if this woman who we, I understand, is the woman in custody or she was never found? No, not found. Never That's found. why they're still looking for her. And this was in March, right, in the, right as soon as COVID-19 started. Wow. So, so, so then, would the point be for this exercise, the perpetrator's actions define the scope of the response of the victim? Yes, they do. You are reacting to what you see. And you may not know all the details. This is going to get into the same thing we have with, with police now and qualified immunity. But uh, it's a similar issue. You don't know everything that's going on when suddenly you're attacked. When suddenly someone crashes through your front door, you grab your gun and you fire because it's 3 in the morning and it turns out it's a 12-year-old child. That gets to our next slide, if we could, the first video. There you are. You only can react to what you know at the time. Thank you. If we can have our next video. And... Okay. I want to keep watching. <laughs> this was a video of a woman spitting on the, if we could stop it right there. Well, just keep going. Uh, is this a situation where the woman is not wearing a mask in a convenience store, which has a, a marked sign saying you must wear a mask? Is that spitting towards the clerk? Is that, could, could that be a deadly weapon? Could that be great bodily injury? Or, Bob, I'm asking wow. the question. Yes. Well, it could be. Um, obviously, she is trying to use it as a weapon. Um, if she's not wearing a mask, it is reasonable to believe that, you know, if she's yelling at the clerk, it's reasonable to believe that she, and she spits, is it reasonable to think she might carry the virus? Yes. Uh, again, we, you, when you don't know all the facts, you can only react to what you see or what the perp says. As to the person taking this video, Assume that the lady turns around but does not spit. Does he have the right at that moment to draw his weapon? Is that enough in, in, in your experience? No. It's Why? Not. Why, Bob? Because he's not the target of the attack. She is not trying to spit on him. If the spitting continues towards you, is that enough to pull your weapon? And our people have got to know about this. Her only weapon is her spit. Yes, I believe it would be when we get into actually using the gun would be a, a bridge further yet. But if someone is advertising that they have the Chinese virus and they spit at you, I would consider that a dangerous assault. Exactly. Let's make the point again, Bob. Lady turns around and says, waves her lab report, I have just tested positive for COVID-19 and spits. Result? Result is your life's in danger, particularly if you're an at-risk person. I know it sounds like a ridiculous example, but this is happening right now. May we have the next slide? You're harassing me. My I'm not a harassing. You're coming close Back to me. Threaten me again. Now. Back the f up with your down. This me. is our Costco Chad, I guess, to use the current right. terminology of a, of a of a of uh, a of an advantaged white male. I guess they're calling him Chads, and the women are Karens, according to the producers here at uh, at Rigel Studios. We just saw uh, the uh, we just saw the 7-Eleven Karen. But this man, not Threat wearing a mask again. in Costco, Bob. Question is approaching the videographer for YouTube or whatever. Is that me. enough of a threat for the videographer to pull a firearm? Answer, yes or no? No. Why? He's, it's a verbal assault. He's chewing out the guy for whatever reason. Without hearing what he's saying, uh, he's just yelling that he, the idea is he doesn't have to wear a mask. I, I don't know what he's yelling. But what he's actually saying, given that demeanor, would make a great deal of difference. Without hearing what he's saying, it's a verbal assault. Uh, 
Hell, I've yelled at you like that, and you haven't shot me but yet. So the the man, the the Costco Chad was yelling, uh, "You're assaulting me! You're threatening me!" Is that enough to respond with the firearm? No. But Bob, tell the audience if you don't mind. We we had this example about two months ago. Can you tell them your example of your own experience at Walmart, standing in line? I I was at a Walmart, and I had a. Uh, there, I was at the end of the line, and there's a whole pile of shopping carts and so forth. And a couple of guys were picking up the shopping carts and throwing them into the planter because there was no room to stand in line and being very boisterous about the security. And I'm watching them to see if they're going to throw them at any people. They didn't. They were just trying to annoy the staff. When suddenly I felt something next to me, and there's a guy standing next to me, appeared to be a, a vagrant, smelled bad, looked bad, and he's in my space, actually pressing his body against mine. I pushed him back or spun away a little bit, so I was out of contact with him, and he started yelling at me, you're the one, you ruined my life. You know, I thought he was a fan, but he obviously wasn't. Um, and there was a security guy standing about four feet away from me, so I turned to him and I said, I need some help here. And as I turned back, the guy was hot-footing it through the uh, parking lot, running away, screaming at the top of his lungs. Um, he got into my personal space. Was it reasonable for me to point my gun at him? Well, one, we were too close for that. Uh, if I come up with a gun, he would have had hands on the gun. I need to, need to have a little space if you're going to pull a gun. Um, but, and by the time I turned around, he was running away. Um, could I have shot him? I'm, you know, here I am at, at mid-70s, past mid-70s, uh, underlying issues, certainly. Who uh, that's over 65 doesn't have some underlying health issues, you know. So uh, it didn't come up because of the distance and the circumstances, and he ran. And your training. And, yeah, I had to have distance to have the gun out because then we'd have been fighting over the gun which would have been a total disaster so because we're in a crowd of people and there's children there and this and that and the other thing so the training was yeah i listened to my own lectures and i didn't pull my gun because it was too close to pull the gun if i had to do anything with him it would have been to take him down to the ground and i really didn't particularly want to touch him so there we are may we have the next slide please or the next video okay bob this is the couple in St. Louis where the agitators broke through a gated community, private street, and, uh, and went to this house. Now, the St. Louis District Attorney is still contemplating charges against these two people who are lawyers and uh, observation as to these people coming out of their house to defend their property. Well, apparently the, the protesters crashed through their front gate, which is not shown on this video. That's how they got there. It's a gated community with a heavy steel <laughs> gate that uh, blocks the front. Their house, there's, there's several houses in this little complex. Theirs is the one directly on, on the other side of the gate. So as the, these guys crashed through, the the homeowner, of course, had tried to call 911, and it's private. They got some answer that wasn't satisfactory. Nobody's coming now. Uh, we'll be there in a day or two or a couple of hours or we're backed up on calls. Uh, we have no one available. Whatever the, the dispatch said, which was no doubt the truth. They couldn't get there at the time. Um, so the guy has his AR-15 rifle. Uh, he is not holding it uh, with his hand on the grip where he can reach the trigger. He is holding the where the stock joins on the back end of it. The wife however, comes up with a handgun and she is holding it uh, where she can pull the trigger and she does actually point it at the demonstrators. Um, they took the better part of valor and didn't charge the house. They were within 15, 20 feet of these people. They are worried about their house being burned down. They're worried about physical injury to themselves. The protesters are, are yelling that, we're going to take over your house. We're going to be living in your house, and I'm going to kill your dog. Uh, they brought up because the dog was barking at the at the bad guys. Um, all of this was going on, and she was reasonable 
in pointing the firearm, in my opinion. They were close enough to be a danger. They were threatening to take over a house and burn it down um, and kill her dog. So obviously they were in good stead to do this. The more interesting part of this to me was if we look at the people, they are both lawyers. They are dyed in the wool liberal lawyers. They have donated to most liberal causes. Uh, and as a last resort, you know, got some guns because they were worried about getting their house attacked and burned down. And now uh, they've kind of switched sides that they've seen, but I've seen this before with some liberal politicians, that they, when it comes down to them, they suddenly become pro-gun. Yes. But as to this, as to this scenario, real time, this is what, within the past 10, 15 days, yeah. the people on the one hand have been vilified by the mainstream media. On the other hand, they're, they're a hero and a heroine. So what, so what do we tell our audience? If we're at the gun show, I know we'd be talking about this and we're talking about it now because we don't have a gun show. This is our, our alternative COVID-19 format. <laughs> what do we tell the people? That don't run out of your house with a gun, but when you've got a crowd of agitators who have busted in the gate, that's telling me they're not, they're, they're these, these average communities. I live in a 55 and older community and there's no gates or anything. This is going to happen. What do we tell our audience to do and what kind of training can they get in order to try to, uh, to learn about responding? Well, what they should do is stay in the house call the police, stay in the house. There's a huge difference between busting through the gate and busting through the front door. So staying in the house where the, the bad guys actually have to break the perimeter of the house, it's gonna cause broken glass and this, that, and the other thing, um, puts you on better legal ground than if you shoot them in your front yard. Even though they had crashed through the gate where the left side left that particular part of the event off their newscast, I would recommend that they stay inside the house. And they, they tried to and eventually did get private security to come help them, I understand. Um, but the, uh, you obviously can't call private security when the people are bashing in your door and saying, I need an right. officer here right now. You can't get the police. Getting private security there in time is, is even more remote, impossible, basically. So I would tell them to stay inside the house and wait as long as they could until the people actually were breaking the perimeter of the house itself before using gunfire. Question, Bob. Does the, do the number, does the number of agitators, more than one, more than two, a whole crowd, does that make a difference in the self-defense scenario when we're, you and I are in court? Does that make a difference to this jury? It makes a huge difference. And how? You know, if there's one guy, they would expect, you know, if the one guy is a 14-year-old kid who's yelling at them, they would expect the homeowner to, you know, punch him upside the head or whatever, um, use soft hands, techniques, whatever he can do uh, along that line. Um, the, if there's two of them, are there, is there more danger? Yes. If there's five of them, is there more danger? If there's 25 of them, is there yet more danger? Yes. All these confrontational situations are different. Whatever happens to you is not going to be the same as what happened to somebody else. Ages, weapons, distance, aggravation level, etc., are always different. That's how when we look at case law, when we're in court trying to uh, defend somebody or uh, sue somebody, the, you look at similar cases for case law reference but they're only similar cases. They are never exactly, exactly the same. And that's the points that we end up arguing on is, well, yeah, that was a similar case, but that was a 12-year-old or that was an 11-year-old who was big for his age or they were nine feet away instead of eight feet away. They're all different. So my advice, again, would be not point your gun. Um, the, the, the guy handled it okay. He went out and bought an AR-15. Good for him. He finally realized he needed a real gun. And uh, he changed his opinion, I guess. Uh, the wife pointing the gun, I would, I would wait until they right. actually crashed through the door. All right. Now, 
Uh, Bob, um, Rigel Studios uh, contacted me last week about this issue, and I had this issue come up with uh, concealed weapons uh, instructors, uh, actually during the instruction, and they put me on the speakerphone. Question, I have a concealed weapon permit. May I wear a mask as, I, as I'm carrying my weapon? Answer, Bob. The answer legally is yes. In my opinion, I got a lawyer right here next to me. Um, in reality, you have to realize the risk you are taking that somebody is going to think you're an armed robber when you come into their place of business or their home. Okay, so use restraint. So now, I, I would be very careful where you do that. We have uh, someone called and said there's a law in Nevada. There is no law in Nevada. The law in Nevada would be. If I am disguising my image, my face, in order to perpetrate a crime, that is against the law. Yes. But where I'm wearing a mask, now the first thing in concealed weapon permit is the word concealed. Concealed means concealed. It does not mean wearing a wife beater to Walmart and having your weapon underneath, like I saw a few weeks ago, where I could almost read the serial numbers of his Glock 19 Generation X. I could practically read the serial number on it. Nobody said anything, but if, if there would have been a policeman there, I think that they would have either got him for, they would have issued him a citation or perhaps even arrested him. But we have in California and Illinois specific statutes, and you've got to look at your jurisdiction. They have specific statutes that says you cannot wear a mask while having a concealed weapon permit and having the weapon on you. No such law in Nevada. We want to make it absolutely clear. But as Bob points out, you got to use discretion. Most gun stores do not. Most guns, uh, gun stores do not allow you to have the weapon in the first place, even though it doesn't carry the force of law. They can kick you out, and you don't want to get a trespass from a gun store because the next thing you know, your name's going to be on some kind of a blacklist. Because the gun store community and the FFL community in the state of Nevada, there's what 671 licensed FFLs in the state of Nevada. The, the, the word's going to get around that uh, that you're persona non grata. So, question: Can you address the situation? of wearing the mask, concealed weapon permit at Taco Bell, situation occurs, the guy smacks the, the, uh, the employee, throws the tacos, and turns around and is coming at you, and he's grabbed the, uh, the, the holder of the napkins and says, what are you looking at, and he's raising it. What do you do? Back away and point your gun. And if he continues to pursue you, if there's no place for you to back away from and you're backed up against the wall, you got to do what you got to do to save your life. Okay. So it's still going to be fact dependent. Absolutely. Whether you've got a mask on or not, the guy was going to hit you with the uh, napkin holder at Taco Bell. Yeah. I mean, getting back to the other point, the advice to be if you're going into a gun shop for some reason, and you've got your gun because you're going to class or you want to ask a question about how you load it or whatever, as you step through the door, take the mask off. I know the governor will put you in jail because you're not wearing a mask. Uh, we're all in Governor Sisolak's debt for that. But obviously, there, there's a trade-off here where you need to not scare people because you're wearing a mask. So pull a mask down so they can see your face and say, can I ask you a question? And they go, oh, sure. And then, you know, you can put it back up and walk in the store. Sure. But it, you're in a no-win situation. So you got to disobey the governor. Okay. Well, Bob, I want to thank you for today. This has been a, a very instructive uh, program. And uh, again, we're doing it as our COVID-19 response, uh, which we'd be giving this information at gun shows. Bob, uh, on our closing remarks, uh, anything on uh, upcoming gun shows in the near future? As far as I know, everything so far is canceled. Uh, as, I, as we were talking on the break, the, uh, the Convention Visitors Authority is looking at one in August at the Convention Center. Uh, South Hall, the convention center, as far as the Convention of Visitors Authority is concerned, that show is a go for August. Uh, unless there's some giant change, the governor uh, or the mayor, the whoever wants no gun shows, 
That is not in the purview of the county commission. It's in the purview of the, it's the convention of the third and uh, convention authorities. It is their venue. It is their show. Uh, as far as I know, they are going to have it and it will be on. I will be talking to one of their board members tomorrow, actually. Um, and I'll know uh, well before that show goes. You'll be the second to know. Oh, very good. That it's, they're going to attempt to put it on. The areas we had downtown with the tents and so forth, because of construction down there, the parking has become literally impossible. So most of the shows down there, they're still running a dog show or something, but anything that, that requires a lot of cars and this and that is just a no-go because of the building down there at the, at the downtown uh, location but the convention center should be a go i think it's scheduled for august mid-august uh, yes and that date may move a week or one way or the other because of other conventions and so forth um, but that's a go as far as i know and my viewers will be the third to know yes mr green will be the second to know yes and again uh your viewers and uh, listeners can uh, can call us. My my direct cellular is area code 702-409-8239. And remember to leave your phone number because sometimes it just doesn't come up through the system or whatever. We'll be glad to answer your questions as we have been doing all week. Uh, and uh, again, I want to thank Rigel Studios for this uh, special presentation and all their hard work. And uh, I want to thank Bob, Mr. Bob Irwin and uh, good day to all of you. Thank you.